Good morning again. I uh, trust that uh, everyone had a, a very happy Thanksgiving. Uh, Brenda and I had the uh, opportunity to see our, uh, our girls, brought us a uh, great joy. So we're very thankful for that time. It uh, warms my heart to see everyone here this morning. This being the uh, first Sunday of Advent. We know that the word uh, Advent uh, comes from the Latin word that means coming or arrival. And uh, for, well, for centuries, the church has celebrated the four-week Advent season by lighting the candles in a wreath, reflecting on the coming of Jesus, as is told in Scripture, the circle of the wreath that you see behind me there on the table is uh, represents God's never-ending love for us. The greens that you see around that circle represent Christ's gift of eternal life. And the candles that we see there, of course, announce Jesus as the light of the world. And, uh, you know, the first uh, week of Advent is the week of hope. And the story of Jesus' birth actually began 
We know thousands of years before he was born, God promised uh, the people of Israel that he would provide a Messiah to save them from their sins. And for centuries, the people of Israel waited with that great hope that the Messiah would come. Isaiah chapter 7 verse 14 says, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and call him Emmanuel. So the prophet Isaiah, who lived hundreds of years before our Lord and Savior uh, Jesus, he predicted the birth of Jesus as a promise of hope from God. And the word Emmanuel means God with us, God living with us, and was fulfilled, of course, when Jesus came to live on the earth as Messiah. So we light that first candle, maybe. There's not been a year when those candles haven't given me some sort of issue. We'll see how it goes. Uh, but that's a light. And let, let that light just represent what it is, the hope. And we have that hope. And we go out into this world and we long to share that hope with those who don't know. It's our, uh, our Lord and Savior. That beautiful name that's above all names, Jesus. Let's go to the Lord in prayer and then we'll go into our study this morning. Lord, we thank you for uh, this beautiful morning. We thank you for this place where we can come, where we can gather together. Thank you, Lord, so much for this gathering here this morning. Uh, just pray that you know our sincere hearts today. We just want to have a passion for you. We want to, as as your people, we want to grow nearer to you. We long to be closer to you. We want that richer, that deeper, that more intimate relationship with you. Uh, I pray, Lord, if there's anything that would be and stand in our way, that we would know and that we would see with the eyes of faith that your arms are mighty enough to remove those things so that we might receive. And I do hope and I do pray that we would have hearts that would receive today all that you have for us from your word. I uh, just thank you again, Lord, for your great love that you show us, the compassion, the mercy, the grace that you shower upon us, Lord. Thank you for being patient with us. Thank you for your gentleness. Thank you for your sovereignty. Oh, Lord, thank you. Thanks for giving us strength for the day. I don't know what's before us today, but you do. And uh, you have us well equipped for it. So, uh, may your spirit guide us through the study of your holy word this morning. And may all that we do, everything that we say, just bring glory and honor to you, to your name, and your name only, in Jesus' name. We pray, amen. amen. And we're going to be uh, looking... Uh, in the Gospel of Matthew this morning. And we're actually going to look at a, a portion of Scripture that I would, I would imagine many of us, if we don't skip over it completely, we just give it a glance, uh, you know, maybe skim over it uh, when we're entering into the Christmas narrative uh, and the whole nativity story, of course. But, you know, I wouldn't expect any of us to sit around the Christmas tree reading this portion of text either. Uh, but, you know, I have to say, you know, as we look at this genealogy uh, this morning in Matthew chapter 1, verses 1 through 17, that this list of names is important. Uh, it has to be. Or else 2 Timothy 3.16 doesn't mean all that much, right? All scripture, right? Every bit of it Amen. comes from God. And it, it has to be relevant, right? And so uh, there's great relevance here. I mean, this genealogy that we're going to look at this morning, I mean, it puts Jesus in world history. It, it means that all Jewish history was just preparing for Jesus and probably much more than all of that is that it shows God's providence, that God rules. He ruled and we'll see, he overruled uh, 
in order that his plan uh, would be and come through. That being that his son, his one and only, would come to the world. And uh, we're, uh, we're so thankful and grateful this morning. We're going to look at Matthew chapter 1, uh, verses 1 through 17, at this list of ancient and sometimes I feel unpronounceable names. And, uh, uh, and then we'll uh, see and go into a, a study of this. It's important. And I hope that we'll see that as we enter into it today. Uh, we have a surprise reader. Tommy's going to read through all these incredible... No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. It's actually your dad. He's gonna <laughs> Not at all. Not at all. I'll take care of that. A record, Matthew chapter 1, a record of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac, Isaac the father of Jacob, Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers, Judah the father of Perez and Zerah, whose mother was Tamar, Perez the father of Hezron, Hezron the father of Ram, Ram the father of Aminadab. You thought I was going to mess that up. Aminadab, the father of Nation. I did pause there. Nation, the father of Solomon. Solomon, the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab. Boaz, the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth. Obed, the father of Jesse. And Jesse, the father of King David. We take a deep breath and continue. David was the father of Solomon, whose mother had been Uriah's wife. Solomon, the father of Rehoboam. Rehoboam, the father of Abijah. Abijah, the father of Asa. Asa, the father of Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat, the father of Jehoram. Jehoram, the father of Uzziah. Uzziah, the father of Jotham. Jotham, the father of Ahaz, Ahaz, the father of Hezekiah, Hezekiah, the father of Manasseh, Manasseh, the father of Amon, Amon, the father of Josiah, and Josiah, the father of Jeconiah and his brothers at the time of the exile to Babylon. Last portion, after the exile to Babylon, verse 12, Jeconiah was the father of Shealtiel, Shealtiel, the father of Zerubbabel, Zerubbabel, the father of Abiud, Abiud, the father of Eliakim, Eliakim, the father of Azor, Azor, the father of Zadok, Zadok, the father of Achim, Achim, the father of Elihu, Eliud, the father of Eleazar, Eleazar, the father of Mathan, Mathan, the father of Jacob, and Jacob, the father of Joseph husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called Christ. Thus, there were 14 generations, we're told in verse 17, in all, from Abraham to David, 14 from David to the exile to Babylon, and 14 from the exile to the Christ. I can't stand up here as pastor and tell you that this is important, not read it out loud, right? Those are the names. And this is important. This is, uh, you know, when we, th these verses of scripture, they connect our Lord Jesus with all of the messianic uh, prophecies that are given in the Old Testament scriptures. Matthew chapter 22, beginning in verse 41, says that while the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them, what do you think about the Messiah? Whose son is he? The son of David, they replied, right? The Messiah was to be a son of David. So tracing his ancestry back to King David was proving that he was qualified to be the Messiah. And that all the prophecies of the Old Testament scriptures could be legitimately linked with our Lord Jesus. And wherever the, and whenever the genealogy of a, a king was given, it was always from the fathers down to that king, whoever the son was. So as Matthew is writing this genealogy, he's writing to the Jews, and he starts the genealogy with Abraham. Son of Abraham was applied to the Jewish people in general. So Matthew begins by reminding us that Jesus is Jewish. 
He's speaking about the king of the Jews that came down from Abraham. So in Matthew's gospel, we have the lineage of the genealogy of a king. And the reason why Matthew brings us the genealogy of a king is because he's trying to prove that legal right of the Lord Jesus Christ to be Messiah, to be that heir of David's throne, and he does this through Joseph. So Matthew is following the line of Joseph, Jesus' legal father, right, in that earthly sense, through David's son Solomon. I'm not going to read Luke's genealogy for you in Luke, in Luke chapter 3 this morning. I absolutely urge you uh, to read not only through what we find here in Matthew chapter 1, but also the genealogy that we find in Luke chapter 3. In Luke's genealogy, Luke is, we believe, following the line of Mary, Jesus' blood relative through David's other son, Nathan. So Luke chapter 3, verse 23 says, Jesus himself was about 30 years old when he began his ministry. He was the son, so it was thought, Luke says, of Joseph, the son of Heli. So since there was no Greek, there's no Greek word for son-in-law, uh, you know, Joseph was called the son of Heli uh, by marriage to Mary, who was Heli's daughter. So what it's saying is that through either Mary's or Joseph's line, Jesus is a descendant of David and therefore he is eligible to be the Messiah. Uh, Matthew proves that our, our Lord Jesus through Joseph as his legal father in the eyes of the nation anyway, well, he was legally to be heir of the throne of David and could be qualified as Messiah. He was born of Mary. So he was naturally of the line of David. He was naturally able to be the Messiah. And this is the perfection of God's plan. I mean, it's beautiful. And I hope that we see that as we look through uh, these verses this morning. That this is something that no human, no man or woman could ever have conceived in their human minds to bring forth the Messiah from the virgin's womb. But that virgin should be related to David naturally, and she should marry a man related to David legally and royally. And it's just amazing. It's perfect. And that's our God, you know? Uh, and this is all brought together. And that supernatural providence of God, God left absolutely no room for any other man to come and claim to be Messiah. Impossible. Uh, and it's just a beautiful thing. Matthew chapter 1, verse 17 says, There were 14 generations in all, from Abraham to David, 14 from David to the exile to Babylon, and 14 from the exile to the Messiah. And Matthew doesn't mean uh, all the generations that lived you know, during those times, but rather all, you know, rather, uh, all that he included in his list. Matthew doesn't. At, at all, you know, expresses intent to reveal, uh, you know, 42 generations uh, from Abraham to Jesus, but rather those three segments of Jewish history, and they're each comprised of 14 generations. You know, it, it's plausible, anyway, that David's name being mentioned twice there uh, in verse 17 indicates his inclusion in both the first and the second groupings, possibly. If so, well, then, you know, then the first begins with Abraham and ends with David, 14 generations. The second begins with David and ends with Josiah, 14 generations. And the third begins with Jeconiah and ends with Jesus, 14 generations. You know, and, and there are some who think that Matthew uses those 14 generations because the numerical value of David's name in Hebrew letters is 14. And there was a Jewish practice of counting that numerical value of words. I don't know if that's the case. Take that for what it is. However, I think it's amazing that it's not just the names that fulfill Scripture, but even the numbers. You know, so now, you know, Matthew does omit some names. Uh, and that's important for us to recognize. Uh, he omits three generations of kings between uh, Jehoram and Uzziah in verse 8. 
the names uh, Ahaziah, Joash, and Amaziah are in the Old Testament list that we find in 1 Chronicles chapter 3, verses 10 through 12, but they're not found here uh, within this portion in Matthew chapter 1. Uh, so why are those men left out? A again, you ask incredible questions. I'm so grateful. You know, well, it might be that Matthew left them out because they were the descendants of Athaliah. Uh, you know, Athaliah, we know, was the daughter of King Ahab, who was a wicked king, and, of course, Queen Jezebel. Uh, so she was the only female monarch who was to sit on David's throne, you know, throughout biblical history. Uh, Athaliah rivaled the wickedness of the kings who came before she rivaled the wickedness of the kings who came after, to be honest. You know, she was an avid, avid Baal zealot. Uh, and as queen, uh, Athaliah used all of her influence to further establish Baal worship uh, all throughout Judah, uh, installing priests and building altars for her idol, uh, as we know, in the very temple of the Lord, following in the footsteps of of course, of her mother, uh, Jezebel. And you can read about that in 2 Kings chapter 11, 2 Chronicles chapter 24. So as you read through her story in the 11th chapter of 2 Kings in the, or um, 22nd, 23rd chapters of 1 Chronicles, Athaliah desired to just simply destroy, just annihilate the kingly uh, seed of the house of Judah. And she sought to destroy the line of the Messiah. Uh, that, that was her purpose. You know, so her son, uh, Ahaziah, was, I mean, again, a, a wicked and uh, evil king. And his son, Joash, uh, he actually started well in his appointment as king, doing what was right in the eyes of the Lord, we're told. But then later, he revived the Baal worship. He revived the Asherah worship that we read of throughout uh, Scripture and that occurred throughout Judah. And he ignored all the warnings of the prophets that God had sent. And then when Joash's son, Amaziah, uh, took over the throne, he too actually did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, uh, but the Bible notes that he was more like his father, Joash, than his ancestor David. And the people still went on and they sacrificed to idols, Baal, the Asherah poles that were set up, and so on. And God doesn't have them here. And I find that amazing. It's really incredible. In the, in the listing of Jesus' forefathers, there's a name missing, we find. Uh, excluded from the, the list is uh, Jehoiakim, uh, or uh, you know, Eliakim, in verse 11, who was uh, Josiah's son and Jeconiah's father. Uh, you can read First Chronicles chapter 3. Uh, the reason for his exclusion may have been that he was... I don't know what else to call him, but a puppet king. You know, he was given his rule by the Pharaoh of Egypt, and Jeconiah, we know, did evil in the eyes of the Lord like his father. So the Lord said, we can read in Jeremiah chapter 22, verse 30, record this man as if childless, a man who will not prosper in his lifetime, for none of his offspring will prosper. None, and this is important, None will sit on the throne of David or rule anymore in Judah. So then it brings the point. If Jesus is a descendant of Jeconiah, then how can he be the Messiah? Since that curse bars any of Jeconiah's descendants from assuming David's throne. Because, and this is uh, the, this will be our foundational text throughout the series leading up to Christmas. Galatians. Chapter 4, verses 4 and 5. When the set time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law that we might receive adoption to sonship. You know, his mother was of David's line, but not through Jeconiah. Joseph was Jesus' legal father, but not his physical one. So, Jesus was of royal blood through Mary, but the curse of Jeconiah stopped with Joseph and was not passed on to Jesus. you got to love it. 
You have to. You know, that means that all of the darkness throughout history that tried to prevent it, no, you know, no matter how hard it tried, yeah. couldn't do it. Yeah. From generation to generation, whatever darkness tried to prevent God's plan from coming through, couldn't, no. Hallelujah. It was never going to happen. God would see it through. And I, it's just beautiful. Uh, Greek readers often called uh, the book of Genesis the book of generations. And the title is also used for genealogies. Genesis chapter 5, verse 1, uh, reading from the Amplified. This is the book that is the written, the, the, written, the written record, the history of the generations of the descendants of Adam. So when you read down the generations of Adam, you'll see the words, oh, and he died, and he died, and he died. Oh, you'll see them over and over and over again. So it's a generation of, of death that came upon all men via sin through Adam, our forefather. But when you turn to Matthew and what we're looking at this morning, this is a new generation. This is the generation of Jesus Christ. So what Adam had just wrought on humanity by his original sin, now we have the last Adam and he's coming through the nativity of Christ Jesus our Lord born in Bethlehem to undo and to reverse the curse, to reverse everything in contrast to the first Adam. It's beautiful. The first, you know, that generation of Jesus Christ, the, the son of David and the son of Abraham, both David and Abraham were promised sons. Abraham was promised a son in Isaac, which meant laughter, we know. And David was promised a son in Solomon, which meant peaceful. Laughter and peaceful. But what was in Abraham's heart and what was in David's heart failed. Isaac failed to really grasp the promises that God had given to his father Abraham. And in spite of all his wisdom and in spite of all the gifts from God in his life, Solomon's sin just ultimately caused the fall of the whole Davidic line. The whole dynasty. You know, it, it all points toward another who would perfectly perfectly fulfill all of the promises that were given to Abraham's sons and David's sons, and that's our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, Jesus said, John chapter 8, verse 58, very truly I tell you, before Abraham was born, I am. Amen. You know, he said, something greater than Solomon is here. You could read that uh, in the Gospels of Matthew chapter 12 and in Luke chapter 11. You know, I love that. Before Abraham, I am something greater than Solomon. That's our Lord. He fulfilled it perfectly. You know, Jesus realized and he fulfilled all the purposes that were failed in Isaac, all the purposes that were failed in Solomon, and all after him. You know, in his sacrifice, in his beautiful and, and glorious resurrection, right? Perfectly fulfilled. In marrying a Gentile bride, the church, right? He, the bridegroom, we, the bride. In building a spiritual temple and just sending forth his Holy Spirit and do, you know, into it to give power that was necessary. Uh, it's just beautiful. All, all, the, all the aspirations and all, all of the incompetence of men had to be overcome. And even Abraham and David had to look for Christ for that full fulfillment of all of God's purposes and promises. Abraham, we noted as the father of faith, right? Fades out of sight when he sees his faith vindicated in Christ Jesus our Lord. The, you know, the whole government of David, which perpetually failed, waits for Christ's perfect administration upon the earth. You know, you, you have through these time periods, you know, you have, you have the kings, you have the judges, you have the, the, the priests, you have all these things that have been pointing toward the Lord Jesus, and now they're all fulfilled in him. It's incredible. And he starts his gospel to tell you all about it. And it's just, uh, you know, you have these ancient genealogies that, that usually omitted women. We know this. But Matthew, he includes four Four women, three of which were Gentiles. Don't miss that. It's beautiful. And the other was 
at least associated with Gentiles, right? You know, but, you know, Matthew omits the four matriarchs prominent in Jewish tradition. He omits Sarah. He omits Rebecca. He omits Leah. He omits Rachel. So even from the Old Testament, God has always planned a mission to all peoples, everyone. It's, it's just beautiful. You know, Matthew chapter 1, verse 3 mentions Tamar as the mother of Perez and Zerah. Her story is recorded in the 38th chapter of the book of Genesis. Jacob's son, uh, Judah, had three sons, Ur, Onan, and Shelah. Tamar married Ur, but Ur, we know, was evil in the sight of the Lord, so the Lord put him to death in judgment, leaving Tamar a widow. And since it was required that the next of kin care for a brother's widow, Tamar was given to Onan, who was to fulfill his duty to her as a brother-in-law to raise up the offspring for his dead brother. But he uh, purposefully prevented uh, conception, displeasing the Lord, and the Lord uh, killed him in judgment uh, also. Shelah was still a boy uh, and couldn't marry Tamar, so Judah asked her to return to her father's house and wait until Shelah was grown up. However, once Shelah was old enough, Judah didn't honor his promise Tamar remained an unmarried widow, and then Tamar went down into town disguised, we know, as a prostitute, tricked Judah and got him to sleep with her. And she then became pregnant by Judah and bore twin sons, who we see named in our text this morning, Perez and Zerah. So just to recount, incest, right? We have fornication, we have adultery, we have seduction, and yet, and yet, she's in the genealogy of our Lord Jesus. The, the only thing that qualifies her to be there is her shame, but she's there. It's, it's incredible. Matthew chapter 1, verse 5, we see in the name Rahab. Rahab, we know, is a young Canaanite prostitute whose story is found, well, it starts in the second chapter of Joshua continues through the sixth the chapter, but this passage, it, it describes that whole conquest of the fortified city of Jericho by the Israelites. You know, in its day, Jericho was the most important Canaanite fortress city in the whole Jordan Valley. It was a stronghold directly in the path of all the advancing Israelites who had just crossed the Jordan River, we read of in Joshua chapter 3. Before entering that land west of the Jordan, Joshua, we know, sent two spies to look over the land. The king of Jericho heard that the two Israelite spies were within his city. He ordered them to be brought to him. Rahab protected them by hiding them on her roof, and she told them how the citizens of Jericho had been fearful of the Israelites ever since they defeated the Egyptians via the Red Sea miracle that had happened some 40 years prior. And she agreed to help them escape. She provided that she and her family were spared in the upcoming battle. And the spies agreed to her request. And then, safely escaping the city, the two spies returned to Joshua, and they reported that the whole land was melting with fear, is the language. I love that. The Israelites crossed the Jordan into Canaan, and they laid siege to the city of Jericho. And we know, of course, that the city was completely destroyed, and every man and every woman and every child in it was killed. And, as promised, only Rahab and her family were spared. So spiritually speaking, Rahab was not an ideal circumstance to come to faith in the one true God of Israel. She was a citizen of a wicked city that was under God's condemnation. She was part of a very corrupt, depraved, pagan culture. She had not been benefited at all from godly leadership of, of Moses or Joshua, you know, and however, you know, all of that said, she heard the stories of their escape from Egypt. She heard from the many uh, men and women and who came into contact with the Israelites that were to be feared. She heard of the crossing of the Red Sea, the wanderings in the wilderness, the recent victory over the Amorites, all of it. And she learned enough to reach that correct conclusion. Joshua chapter 2, the second part of verse 11. 
For the Lord your God is God in heaven above and on the earth below. That's the conclusion. You know, and so this change of heart, this, this faith, and coupled with the actions that were prompted by faith that saved her and her family, and that's why we find her in the genealogy of Christ. Friends, do not skip over the genealogy. Study, it's good. You look at these names, the names that were included, those that were omitted, it's telling us so much. Second part of verse 5 of Matthew chapter 1, we read of Ruth, the mother of Obed. There's no stain on Ruth's character, right? But her problem, we know, is that she was a Moabitess, right? And the law of Moses was against the Moabites and cursed them. In fact, we read in Deuteronomy chapter 23, reading from verse 3 of the Amplified Translation, it says an Ammonite or a Moabite shall not enter the assembly of the Lord, none of their descendants, even to the tenth generation, shall ever enter the assembly of the Lord. But, but, faith, we know, brought Ruth into the Lord's people along with her children and third generation after her. Her great-grandson is King David himself. It's awesome. You know, what the law had cursed, what happened? Grace set aside and brought her in. In verse 6, we see Uriah's wife, the mother of Solomon, uh, the, the wife of Uriah, the Hittite, of course, we know, although not named there, was Bathsheba. And, uh, you know, we know Bathsheba was the woman who David committed adultery with. And I believe that that's probably David who's in view here, not Bathsheba. And, it, and of course, it doesn't mention her name. It only makes sense. Here you have the, the, the believing King David, whose uh, lineage here we have, uh, but we, you know, we see that he can fall into the very depths of sin and shame, and yet he's here. He's here. You know, his backsliding that he committed didn't at all disqualify him from God's grace. Grace just pours and shines through it all. And it's, it's beautiful. Matthew's purpose Part of Matthew's purpose in this genealogy, it's, it's not to cover up sin. I hope you can see that. It, it's not to cover up the, the sin of some of the ancestors of Jesus. But what it actually does is when we really look at it and we see these names and we recall their stories and the narratives that we see throughout Scripture, we see that in the genealogy it emphasizes the sin in a sense and the shame. And that on the, the human side of Jesus' ancestry was part of the world. You know, later on in uh, verse 18, actually from verse 18 on that we'll start looking at uh, next week, he emphasizes that Jesus was apart from sin and he came to redeem us. You know, we're looking at the divine heredity next week. So apart from sin, our Lord and Savior, in his lineage, he associates with the sinner. That's what we see in this, this genealogy, in this list of ancient names. You know, it's just such an illustration and it's such a symbol of the gospel that the, you know, the, we had the division between Jew and and Gentile is broken down, male and female, clean and unclean, because he didn't come to call the righteous. We know that our Lord and Savior came to call sinners to repentance. Amen? Amen. You know, is it any wonder then that we find in verse 21 that God gives him the name Jesus? Jehovah is salvation. Jesus. Friends, as, you, uh, as we uh, enter into this uh, Advent season... I urge you again uh, to look at and ponder some of the names that you find here that Matthew recorded within the genealogy that Luke recorded in chapter 3. They're very different, but there are no contradictions. All they do is point to God's plan being perfect, that Jesus had to be brought forth this way. He's qualified to be Messiah in the earthly sense. We'll see 
in a much more divine sense next time that we gather. But all of it points to the fact that you and I should come and do exactly what we sing, worship and adore him. Oh, come, let us adore him. Oh, come, let us adore him. Come, you, King City Bible Church, let us adore him, Christ Jesus our Lord. What a beautiful season. And what beautiful words for our heart this morning. you got to love our God. Every bit of what he does from beginning to end is just perfect. It's for love of us. Who are we? But he loved us. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Uh, I, I, Lord, it's a list of names. And we can see it like that. But I'm just amazed that when we sit down and when we take the time to really dive into it and let your spirit guide us through the purpose of the author, the audience that he was speaking to, the reasons for the presentation as it was, and the names that are included. It's just astounding. I, I, the names that are included, the names that are omitted, but all of it just pointing to the perfection of your plan. All of it pointing to the fact that it's, it's unmistakable. Jesus is Messiah. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is salvation. It's just, it's just wonderful. And the fact that we have Emmanuel, God with us, God living with us, it's just, it's just amazing. Thank you for your word. Thank you, Lord, that no part of your word is, is irrelevant. It, it all points to this beautiful story this glorious story that's not fabricated. It's nothing make-believe. It's just a beautiful love story. And I'm just so thankful that we're a part of this. I, I just so grateful that it's your love and your grace that just wraps around us brings us peace, that brings us joy, and that we might continue and go on praising your name, offering you thanksgiving for all that you do. There was no sin that was so great, there was no shame that was so great, there was no darkness that was so deep and so awful that it would prevent the coming, the first coming of our Lord and our Savior. Thank you. Thank you for your perfect sovereignty. And uh, I, I do pray, Lord, that we'll just see the, even in this, just the wonder of it all. And just stand in just awe of who you are. Your hand upon everything. May it bring us encouragement. And again, may it bring us joy and may it bring us just wonder and reverence of you as we enter this season. Um, thank you again for your spirit helping us through the word. Um, may we consider none of it boring, <laughs> but really take it in and understand all the more who you are, that great, unchanging, unshakable God. Jesus, in the most precious name we pray, amen.